Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to PrepMedic. This week's video, we're taking off tourniquets. Yep, you heard that correctly. This week we are talking about taking off tourniquets. This procedure is called a tourniquet conversion. Now, a couple disclaimers before you get started. I'm just some guy on the internet. You shouldn't do anything in your daily life just because some guy on the internet said for you to do it. Otherwise, if you are not trained to do this, if you do not have a license or work under somebody's license that allows you to do this and your protocols and state laws don't align, to allow you to do this, don't do this procedure. It is dangerous. And like I said, I'm some guy on the internet. With all of that being said, let's get into the video. So oftentimes tourniquets are applied in direct threat care or care under fire. They're the same thing. It depends if you're following TCCC or TECC. So in both of these instances, the liberal use of tourniquets has been taught. So if you are shot in the leg or the arm and you've got some bleeding, don't think about it too much, throw in a tourniquet and that can be addressed at a later time. Now, unfortunately, although very safe in many situations, tourniquets do have complications that come from them. First and foremost, you have pretty extreme pain for whosoever it's applied on. Second, if it's on for a prolonged amount of time, you have cellular metabolite that builds up from anaerobic metabolism in that arm that has no circulation. If that tourniquet's released after several hours, you can have that flood back into the body without proper pharmacology that can cause cardiac arrest and many other metabolic issues internally. And last but not least, you have prolonged uh, nerve and neuro changes to that arm. So yes, if a tourniquet's on for too long, it can cause the loss of limb, even though that's been relatively overstated. Just because a tourniquet's on doesn't mean they're necessarily going to lose that extremity. So that's where tourniquet conversions come in. We do tourniquet conversions to minimize those complications. Now, generally speaking, we want to perform a conversion as soon as possible. The official guidelines are we try to do it under two hours because under two hours of a tourniquet being applied, the chances of major complications from that tourniquet are minimal and there's very little risk to loosening it if we have the proper uh, adjuncts in place. Now, we don't want to do it after six hours. So if the tourniquet's been on for six plus hours, we are not going to perform a tourniquet conversion in the field no matter what. They need very specific pharmacology to do that safely and that should be performed at a hospital. At this point, we're talking about potential loss of a limb, regardless of what you do. So in between that two hours and six hours, that's a gray zone. And the official literature says that there probably isn't that much risk in that time period, but you're gonna have to fall back on your experience and whatever situation the patient's in. Number two, we are only performing a tourniquet conversion on a patient that is not in shock. If you have a patient that has a low blood pressure, a high pulse rate, not explained by other anxiety producing factors or his altered mental status, anything to tell you that that patient has lost a lot of blood, we don't wanna perform a tourniquet conversion because we could cause them to lose what little of blood they have and then we're gonna put them in a much worse state for trying to do this. At that point, it is life over limb and we're going to choose life. So uh, I'm gonna bring this trainer up here and for the purposes of this demonstration, this wound is out of play. We're not talking about this at all. We're just pretending that this is the wound that the tourniquet was applied for. So generally speaking, we do this in the civilian side in law enforcement where uh, you've had an officer that's been shot or a suspect that's been shot and a tourniquet's been applied in haste. And we really wanna look at that and see uh, if it's something that actually needs a tourniquet. So we have this wound here. My patient is not in shock. The tourniquet was applied less than two hours ago. So I'm feeling pretty good about trying to uh, convert this. Now we have to do some things to set it ourselves up for success. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna take a plus one tourniquet and apply this to the patient. So if the first tourniquet is two to three inches above the wound, I'm gonna take this and put this two to three inches above that tourniquet. If this tourniquet was placed high and tight on the extremity, I'm gonna take the secondary tourniquet and I'm gonna put it two to three inches above that wound. So we want it realistically as close to that wound as possible. So we're gonna take this tourniquet, we're gonna put it over the extremity and this is a trainer. So just bear, bear in mind, that, keep that in mind. Oh gosh, I can't talk today. All right, so we got this on and I'm going to tighten it. I'm just not going to turn the windlass at all. So we have this in place. That's pretty tight there. Um, you'd really want to crank that down in the real world just to make sure that that windless slack is taken up and I am ready to go if I need to apply it. 
Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the wound. If it's a cavitated wound and I need to pack it, I'm going to take hemostatic gauze. Uh, this is just normal gauze here, but I'm just using this for demonstration purposes. And I'm going to pack that wound as much as I can and get that kind of filled in. Because I'm on my own, this is a dummy here, and uh, this is kind of a pain. If it's not amenable to packing, we're gonna just take a pressure bandage and we're going to wrap the wound as good as we can. So I'm gonna wrap this here, speed the camera up a little bit so you don't get too bored. All right, so that was surprisingly hard to do uh, on a dummy, but we have that wound packed with hemostatics and then we have a pressure bandage over it. We wanna keep this in place for at least three minutes before we try to do anything. That gives the hemostatic agent time to work. Uh, it will also make sure we are solidifying whatever clots are in the wound. So we have both these tourniquets in place and we're ready to go just in case something fails. So if I loosen this and it starts to bleed, I'm gonna to go to my tourniquet and I'm gonna tighten the plus one tourniquet before I tighten this. We're gonna keep both in place. If this does not stop the bleeding, then I will keep this tightened and I will tight, tighten this. Uh, so it's kind of a redundant uh, tourniquet situation here. The reason being is cats are technically one-time use. Uh, really any tourniquet's one-time use. So if you have had this applied for a little while, there's a chance that wear and tear on the material is starting to uh, cause it to break down and you might have a malfunction trying to tighten it back up. Personally, in, in my experience, what I've noticed is that the first tourniquet is, is oftentimes applied inappropriately or it's a makeshift tourniquet. So if you have somebody coming out with like a belt and it's working, but it's not like an appropriate tourniquet, it's better to have your commercial device ready to go. Chances are if you're doing this, you're a professional responder of some kind. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to, to, to take this tourniquet and I'm not going to loosen the strap. I'm just gonna take that strap back a little bit and I'm going to take the windlass. Now there's two schools of thought. Some people say loosen it very slowly over the course of a minute. The way I was taught was just to loosen it all at once. That helps you assess clot stability. Now I'm going to just loosen this and we're just gonna loosen this. Don't, it doesn't have to be super quick. Take that down and I'm going to monitor this for bleeding through the bandage. If it bleeds through the bandage and I have profuse bleeding there, I'm going to retighten this. Now, it is really important that you do not perform a conversion on an extremity in which you cannot visualize and continue to assess during transport. Because if that patient is getting fluid resuscitated with blood products or even crystalloids, if there's no blood products available, I know there's a lot of controversy there, um, or they're given ketamine for pain treatment, all of these things can raise the blood pressure and an adjunct that was controlling bleeding can actually fail down the road. So I wanna make sure I am continually assessing this leg. If that works, we're done. The tourniquet's converted. I'm still gonna keep these in place for quite a while because I want to be able to intervene quickly. I may loosen the strap for patient comfort if it is relatively tight as it should be. Now, if that is starting to bleed and I'm pretty worried about it, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this plus one tourniquet and I'm going to tighten that back down until bleeding stops pull that over. If that one doesn't work, I'm going to go back to the first tourniquet that was applied and I'm going to tighten that down until bleeding stops. Pull this tail over and we're going to stop the blood flow that way. So a quick recap. We are only doing this if the patient is not in a shock state. We're doing it preferably under two hours, but it can be done under six hours. And we're only doing it if we can continually assess this bleeding extremity throughout transport. If you guys have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments down below, and I will see you next week.